Hey, how are you doing? My name's Elton. I'm a Docker captain and a Microsoft Azure MVP. And thanks for joining me for this session here on DockerCon Live. This is actually my sixth DockerCon. And although the commute was much easier this time, it's a shame that I can't meet you in person. But I hope you'll learn a lot from this session anyway. So in my day job, I'm a consultant, helping companies move their applications to containers. And this session's all about a real world project where I helped a client migrate their existing application to containers so they could run it in the cloud. The subtitle of the session is a Windows migration story, but the focus here is on migration and not specifically on Windows. The key thing about this kind of project is that you're trying to maximize reuse. You're trying to take an application that already works well, and you just want to run it in a different space and give a different way of accessing it. And that's what I'm gonna be focusing on here. Now these real world sessions are often interesting, but hard to relate back to your own projects. So as well as explaining what we've did and giving you some good tips and best practices, there are some major themes that will apply to any containerization project. And the first one is about flexibility. So if you've been using Docker for a little while, you know about the flexibility to be able to run your applications in containers on any platform. And if you're using multi-stage Docker files, then you can build your apps in containers too, using whatever infrastructure you like, using Jenkins or GitHub Actions or Azure DevOps, and it's all the same. But there's one more aspect of flexibility that containers give you, which is flexibility in your application design. So for a long time, I've been saying that containers are not just something that lives in the dev world or the ops world, but it's also gonna affect the security team, IT management, and architects. And having the ability to run components of your applications in containers on potentially different platforms gives you a lot of flexibility in how you design your app. And the next one is speed. And as I walk through the stages of this project, even at a high level, you'll get an idea that we managed to do a lot of work very quickly because we were reusing so much stuff from the community. So we built the new components really quickly. We had them up and running in the cloud super quickly. And because of the flexibility that we built into the design, we were able to change really quickly and have, have different ways of running our application. And the last one is about standardization. So in this session, I'll be using Docker and Kubernetes, and there's a learning curve for both of those. Docker is an easier technology to pick up, but you'll get a lot more benefit from it if you invest the time to learn it properly. And then when you're comfortable with Docker, then you can move on to Kubernetes, which has its own much steeper learning curve. But if you invest the time in learning Docker and Kubernetes and moving your applications to them, you get this layer of standardization in how you model your applications using Kubernetes manifests and Docker files and how different parties can consume your application. So if it's something that third parties can run themselves, all they need to have is a Kubernetes cluster. And if you're adding new members to the team, if they've got a good understanding of Docker and Kubernetes, they'll be up and running super quick. Okay, so let's move on to talking about the project. So in its current incarnation, the whole application runs on the desktop. So there's a UI component and that passes on most of the work as job requests to a separate compute component. Now in the real project, that compute component was all about working out the best places to put wind turbines to harvest the maximum amount of energy. And it was doing some really hardcore computational fluid dynamics that was super compute intensive. So if you wanted to run this stuff, although it was a desktop application, you had to have some pretty serious kit to be able to run it yourself. And then you construct your parameters in the UI, the computations all run in this separate binary, and the two parts communicate together over the file system. And this is a pretty long standing application. So all the hard work is done in the compute module, which uses Fortran, and the rest of the application was written in .NET, and parts of the app are at least 15 years old. Now the goal is to be able to turn this into more of a SaaS model and have a cloud offering. And our initial approach for that was to take the compute module and Dockerize it so we could run it in a container, and we're gonna host that in a container platform in the cloud, which would also have a REST API, also running in a container, which acts as the control plane for the compute layer. So you can submit jobs to be computed and you can query the status of existing jobs. Now we wanted the new delivery to be able to work with the existing desktop. So you would still have your desktop UI, but instead of calling the compute layer directly, it calls into a shim, which looks the same, but actually sends the request for the compute onto the API. And then the shim also takes care of moving the data around. So it uploads the files to a cloud blob storage component where the compute container writes the output. And then the shim copies that down to the local file system. So as far as the UI is concerned, it's all working in exactly the same way. But now we're hosting the whole compute layer in the cloud and we can burst out to whatever level of scale that we need. And the other advantage of moving this to the cloud is that we now have a public API, which we can use with other consumers. So the ultimate goal is to have an alternative to the desktop UI, which is a website that works in exactly the same way and uses the same compute module that the desktop UI calls into, which is actually a wrapper around the original Fortran code. Okay, so let's see how it looks. I've got a bunch of demos to show you, but instead of doing some hardcore computational fluid dynamic stuff, which I don't really understand myself, 
my demo app is just going to be computing Pi. But although it's a much simpler application, it has some of the same concerns, and I'll be following through the same process that we took with the real application. All the demos I'm going to show you are up on GitHub, and at the end of the session, I've got a page of links that will tell you where you can find this stuff. I'm going to start by looking at the Docker file for the compute module. So it's a pretty simple Docker file. So I'm using Windows Container, so you can see that my base image is using the .NET framework, and I've pinned to a specific version, so I'm using 4.8 of the .NET framework running on Windows Server 2019. Now in this approach, I've got a really simple Docker file where I'm just capturing things like the entry point and the command to run the application. So this Docker file really just captures the API. What inputs am I expecting and what outputs am I going to push out? And then the application itself comes from another Docker image. So the purpose of doing this is to make it simpler to work with the image that I'm going to build repeatedly. If I want to change the default environment variables or package some new configuration, I'm working with a nice small Docker file that's going to be quick to build. The main Docker file has got all the complicated installation steps. And in the real application, that's installing all the dependencies, installing the application itself, setting up the registry, a whole bunch of complicated stuff that I don't need to work with day to day. So by breaking that apart into two separate images, like the core image that's got the installation steps and the day-to-day -day image that's got the compute API, I'm making it much easier to work with. Okay, so let's open up my terminal. And we'll see that I'm in Windows container mode here. So if I do a Docker version, I've got the Windows client and the Windows server. Okay, so we're running in Windows containers. I've got Docker desktop installed on my Windows 10 machine, and that's kind of all I need. So firstly, I can just run this container which wraps up my legacy application. So this could be my Fortran application that's doing my computational fluid dynamics, but in this case, it's just running Pi. And by default, the settings that I've got in my Docker file give me Pi to six decimal places, but the container is set up to allow me to specify how many decimal places I want. So if I want Pi to 100 decimal places, I use the same container, I just pass in a different input. And the beauty of that is I've wrapped up this complicated step into a single Docker container that I can run anywhere. So if I want to run a compute job in the cloud instead, I can do that with Azure container instances, where I can just create a new container from that same Docker image. And I'm using the same kind of API, so I can specify how many decimal places I want. And also because I'm in the cloud now, I can specify the amount of compute that I want. So in this case, I can say I want one CPU and two gig of RAM, and this will create a container running up in Azure. And if I decide I want to have something a bit bigger so that I can run a bigger computation, I'm using the same image again. Same API, it's going to pass in a different parameter for the number of decimal places, and I can use a bigger compute instance to run the same container image. Now, this is a Windows container image, and that works fine with Azure container instances. You can spin up a container from a Windows image, and it will run on a Windows server. But one of the disadvantages in having a legacy application packaged in a Windows container image is that they're pretty big. So the base image I'm using has got the latest version of the .NET framework, built on top of Windows Server Core 2019, and that's a fairly big surface area. So that's why my image is six and a half gigabytes, even though my own application is just a few tens of megabytes. But if I go and look at my Azure portal, so I'll see I've got my two container instances here. Here's the one I created to compute Pi to 5,000 decimal places. If I look at the containers, I see a whole bunch of events of when the image started to be pulled, when it got pulled, when the container was started. And if I look at the logs, then I see the output of Pi, to 5,000 decimal places. Um, I won't go through all that because you can probably work out it's just a big load of numbers. If I look at the other instance, this is pi to 250,000 decimal places, and this is still running. So even though this is running on a bigger instance, so there's more compute power available, it's still quite a lengthy calculation. So there'll be no logs in here. It's still running. It'll run as long as it needs to, and then the container will just end. It's the same user experience, but I've got much more compute available to me, and I can scale out as much as I need. And that's all fine, but as a developer or a tester working on the system, you don't want to have a lengthy duration between running each container just to check that everything's working okay. And that's why when you're looking at migrating an existing system, it's a really good idea to create a stub of the application in a separate Docker image, which runs really, really quickly, but has the same API. So if I close down my terminal here and have a look at the stub Docker file, this is based on a Linux container image using Alpine, so it's going to be a super tiny container image. It's got effectively the same API. So the way you call it, it uses the same entry point, which is the name of the real binary. But in this case, that isn't a binary that runs in the container. It's just a simple script. If I go and look at that script, all it does is echo out pi to two decimal places. So that might seem pretty useless, but what it means is I can run that container super quickly. And if I'm working on some other aspect of the application, I can fire off a calculation, check that it runs correctly, and I don't need to know pi to 50,000 decimal places. I can do that for the real computation. But for when I'm iterating on the project, I can run something that looks like the real computation module without having to wait for it all to spin up. 
So if I now switch to Linux containers using Docker desktop, and if I open my terminal back up again, clear this down, my stub has a different image name, but the way I use it is pretty much the same. So I do a Docker run and I get the output out. It's super fast because it's a Linux container which is just echoing out a single command. And if I want to ask it for more decimal places, I can do that and it will work in the same way. It doesn't give me the right result because that's not what it does. It just ignores the input that I pass in, but it does give me an actual result. So I could use this for real. And similarly, if I want to try this up in Azure container instances, I can do the same kind of thing. I can do an AZ container create, and the API is pretty much the same. The command line that I pass is the same as I would use for the real Windows image, but this time I'm saying that I want it to run on Linux, and I can have a tiny instance with one CPU core and half a gig of RAM. And it will work in the same kind of way. But the main difference, of course, is that this is a Linux image based on Alpine. So instead of being six and a half gigabytes, it's actually just five megabytes. So it's super fast to work with. It cuts down a lot of the waste in your development and your testing cycles to have a stub that looks and feels like the real thing, but doesn't do the complicated compute. And the other advantage of that, particularly if you're moving Windows applications and you want to run in Kubernetes, is that by having a Linux stub, you can run the whole thing in a Kubernetes cluster on your laptop without having to spin up a whole bunch of virtual machines. Right now, there isn't a good development experience for having a hybrid Kubernetes cluster where you can run Windows pods and Linux pods. You can run a Linux only Kubernetes cluster super easily. And if you can isolate the compute components and replace them with stubs, then you can work locally in Kubernetes using just Linux containers. So I've got that option here. So using this Kubernetes manifest, this is gonna create a Kubernetes job, which is like a batch job, which will create a pod to run my application container. My application container is using that same Linux container stub that's just gonna echo out Pi. And I configure it in the same way using the same sort of command, passing it the decimal places that I want it to work with. So if I run this, clear myself some space. So what I've got here, I'll have a look at my nodes just to make sure that I'm connected to the right cluster. So I've got Docker desktop running. If I apply my manifest to create my job, that's gonna submit my job for me. And when jobs get submitted, they create a pod and they add a label which has the job name. So if I get the pods, and I filter on the label, then I should see that my pi stub is there and it's completed. And if I look at the logs, then I see the fake calculation of pi that's coming from my stub. And the reason why that's useful is I can work on my Kubernetes job definition. I can work on my manifest. I can get everything running locally. And then as soon as I'm ready, I can submit that to my real cluster in the cloud, which has Windows nodes that will run the application for real. And the only real difference there is in my manifest, I'm specifying the real Docker container image here, which is my Windows image that runs pi. And I've got a node selector in here that says this should run on the Windows node. And that's all I need to do. As long as my cluster has some nodes in there that can run Windows containers, then I can use exactly the same kind of job definition that I use locally to run up in the cloud. So from Docker desktop here, I can switch to my AKS cluster, which is running up in Azure. Let's make the switch. And now if I look at the nodes, just confirm that I have got Windows nodes in there. So I've got multiple nodes in here. And one of them is running Windows. If I create a Windows version of that job, it's, it's exactly the same way of describing my application. It's exactly the same way of interfacing with it. So I should see there's a job in there. And this is in the status container creating. So my Windows node is busily downloading the image. If I look at the pod here, uh, then I will see that it successfully pulled the image. And if I now go and look at the logs, it's computing pi to 100,000 decimal places. And that's done. <laughs> And the final digit is six. And that might come up in a pub quiz at some point. And if you're running with a managed Kubernetes cluster, most of the cloud offerings let you burst workloads out from your cluster into some other container platform. And that's exactly what AKS lets you do. So I can submit a similar job definition, but this one's configured to use the virtual kubelet, which in AKS means I can burst out and create ACI instances, just like I manually created with the AZ command, but Kubernetes will do that for me. So when I submit the jobs, if there's no space left on my cluster to run a new job for me, it will automatically burst out to ACI and I can scale out to whatever I need. Okay, so let's go back to this. So what we saw in that demo was effectively the POC stage of the project, where we just did the bare minimum to get this stuff up and running, to see how it looked and to see what it was gonna give us. So firstly, we took the original compute module and we packaged that up in a Docker container which became the base image that had everything it needs to run the application, but we don't use that directly. Instead, we have a compute image, which has a much simpler Docker file for us to use and iterate on day to day, and it pulls the binaries that it needs out of that base image. 
And as we built out that compute image, we realized we were spending a lot of time moving images around and a lot of time running computations that we didn't really care about the results of. As part of developing the wider project, I don't really need to run the real calculations. And so that's why we have the stub. And the stub looks the same as the main compute module, but it's much lighter, it's much faster, it's much easier to work with. And what that gives us is the ability to run either of those components in any container platform. I can run it in Docker on a server or on my laptop, or I can run it in Kubernetes in the cloud or on my laptop, and it behaves in the same way wherever I run it. Obviously, if I'm using the stub, I don't get the real results, but I get exactly the same user experience. I can use the same Kubernetes manifest, the same Docker commands, and using the stub lets me keep up the pace of the project without constantly running the same computations. And because of that focus on speed, we were able to get that first stage of the project done pretty quickly. We spent about seven days from the initial consultation about what we were aiming to achieve through to getting this stuff up and running in Kubernetes, in the cloud, running the real computations, and also running an equivalent stack locally in the developer machine, just using Docker Desktop with Kubernetes. And that flexibility was something that we really wanted to keep in the project as we went forward. So the next stage was building out the API that kind of abstracted away the details of running the computation, whether it's directly in a Docker container or through a Kubernetes job. And we knew that we wanted to be able to run in different platforms. So we wanted the API not to be exclusively tied to Kubernetes, but to have the option to invoke the compute component in some other container platform. So we focused on maintaining that flexibility in the design. And we're going to go straight back to the next set of demos to see how that looks with the Pi application. Okay, so let's clear this stuff down. Let's go to my demo two. And so I'll start by switching back to Windows containers and I'm gonna run my API. So this is just a REST API, which gives me access to my Pi compute layer, but in a nice way. And I'm gonna run a container that mounts the Docker socket, or in the case of Windows, that's the Docker pipe. So when this API runs, it's gonna be able to talk to the Docker API and create new containers to run the jobs. So let's start this up. My API is up and running. So inside the API container, there's a config file that tells the API how to submit compute jobs. And in this case, it's using the Docker processor. So it's expecting to be able to talk to the local pipe and create new containers. And it's gonna be using the real Windows container image that really does the computation and it's expecting to run on Windows. So that's all fine. That's why I switched back to Windows container mode. Okay, so my API is up and running. So if I make a curl command to my API and I'm just posting a job here and asking it to compute Pi to 700 decimal places. And that's going to the URL where my container is listening. And the response gives me the processor ID, which could be a container image or a Kubernetes job name. So with this here, I can grab the container image and I can do a Docker logs. That's going to be the container ID, sorry. And I get the output here. So the API here is running locally in a Docker container. When I submit a job request, it's going to create another Docker container, which executes the job. And then I can see the logs coming back out. So the API is kind of decoupled from how the job gets processed but it's running the same container image that I've been running up until now. So we're keeping that flexibility. We've really isolated the original compute module, the original kind of legacy application. We've wrapped that up and now we're moving it around and running it in different ways and giving us different ways to consume the application. So if I switch back here, now because I have my stub, which runs in Linux containers, I've got the ability to run my API in Kubernetes and have the API submit a Kubernetes job for me. And that will run my Linux container stub locally. And the only difference between what I'm running locally and what I deploy to Azure is the config file for my API. So let's switch here, make sure I'm using the right Kubernetes cluster. Let's go back to Docker desktop. And the configuration file that I'm going to deploy here to Kubernetes is saying that we're going to use the Kubernetes processor. So when the API receives a request to compute Pi, instead of creating a Docker container, it's going to create a Kubernetes job. Now that's custom code for all that to happen, but it's really pretty simple. And it's all up on GitHub if you want to see how that works. And the Kubernetes job will start a pod and the pod will run a Docker container. And that Docker container is going to be using the stub image this time. So, so I'm going to be running the API locally in Linux in my Kubernetes cluster. And I'll be using the Linux stubs when I compute my jobs in Kubernetes. Okay, so let's go back here. Uh, if I deploy my local configuration first. So this is the config file that's saying I'm going to use the stub when I try and compute Pi, and I deploy the whole rest of the API. So I won't go through all these YAML files because I've only got half an hour, but if you want to look at them, they're all up there. It creates a deployment for the API, which creates a replica set. There's a config map for the configuration details. There's a service account in there and a whole bunch of RBAC stuff so that the API can talk to the Kubernetes API and create new jobs. Okay, so if I have a look and make sure that's all up and running, 
that all looks good. So I've got my API service, which is listening on port 8083. My pods are up and running, that all looks good. Okay, cool. So now it's the same API. So although it's running in Linux rather than Windows, although it's running in Kubernetes rather than in straight Docker, I still talk to it in the same way. So I can curl my local host on port 8083 and ask for pi to hundred decimal places. And the response I get out this time, I still got that processing ID, but this time that is a Kubernetes job name. So if I do kubectl get jobs, and I pass it that processing ID, then I'll see it's completed. And if I look at the logs, again, using that same processing ID, then I get the stub response, which is pi to two decimal places, because it's not running the real computation, because as a developer working on the API, I don't need the real computation. I don't need to submit pi to 500,000 decimal places and wait 10 minutes for it to compute. All I want to do is test that it gets invoked correctly and it gives me some sort of output. So this is perfect. For me. Okay. And the last thing I want to show you is the final aspect of that flexibility, because when I deploy this to my real cluster up in the cloud, which has a mixture of Linux and Windows nodes, I'll be using exactly the same Kubernetes manifests. The only difference will be the configuration file for the API. So inside here, the config map that I'm using in Azure still says to use the Kubernetes processor. I'm not using ACI here, but I've got a flag here in my API that I could burst out to ACI if I wanted to. And this time I'm using the Windows image and I'm using the Windows platform. So when I deploy to Kubernetes in the cloud, this will be the API configuration. I still use the API in the same way, but my API pods will be running on Linux nodes and my actual compute pods that get created by the jobs, they're gonna be running on Windows nodes. Okay, so let's switch out of here. Let's go back to my production cluster. That's my hybrid cluster. And let's just check that I'm in the right place. Yeah, I've got my Windows nodes there. So I'll start by deploying the Azure configuration and then all the rest of the API components. Okay, so that looks good. If I do a quick get to make sure they're all there. That's all looking cool. So I've got inside here, I've got my load balancer API. So that's my public API for my service. So I can go and call this now, but I've got a nice little format in here for kubectl that will give me the full URL of my service. So that's just kubectl get service, but I'm passing it a format string. This is gonna take the public IP address and add on my port and my URL. That's going to give me this address here. I'm just going to pipe that straight into my curl command. So I don't have to worry about where the actual IP address is. This is a load balancer type of service. So I'm going to get a public IP in Azure. So if I compute to 10,000 decimal places, so I get my response back, my processing ID here, that's my job name. So if I do kubectl get jobs with my processing ID, then I see I've got my one completion. It's 18 seconds old, it only took six seconds to run. If I go and look at the logs, again, for that same job ID, then I get my output there and that's running my Windows container. So I'm using exactly the same API code. I'm using exactly the same API modeling in my Kubernetes manifest. I've got a different configuration and I've got the flexibility inside my API to invoke my compute module in different ways, depending on how the platform is running. Okay, so let's go back to the slides. So for that second stage, as we built out the API, we call that the evaluation stage because we were looking at some different options and we wanted to see what the move to the cloud was gonna give us. And as we saw in the demo, we ended up with a few different ways to run our application. So we could run it all locally using Docker desktop with Linux containers in Kubernetes using the stub for the compute module. So we could still run the full end to end, but without the real results and the amount of time it takes to execute those results, which is a really nice pattern if you're trying to migrate something that's compute heavy or IO intensive. If you can stub that stuff out and focus on what you're building around your legacy component, then it's really gonna speed up your delivery. And then we had the option to run in the cloud with a hybrid Kubernetes cluster. So on Azure, on AWS, on GCP, you can run a Kubernetes cluster that has a mixture of Linux and Windows nodes if you want to run a hybrid solution like this. And in our case, we're running the API, which is a brand new .NET Core component. And that's gonna invoke the original compute module by creating Kubernetes jobs, which are configured to run on the Windows nodes. But what you also get with AKS is the ability to burst out from your own cluster, which has a fixed number of nodes, and run additional compute using Azure Container Instances, ACI. And that's a deployment mode, which will allow us to scale to pretty much any level that we need. We can run with a fixed cluster that's good for the regular compute requirements, and know that we can burst out to kind of whatever size we need. And as part of this evaluation phase, when we realized that we'd broken all these things into different containers that we could run in different ways, we looked at one other option, which is not having Kubernetes at all. 
and running the API using a serverless function, using the same container image and bursting out to ACI in the same kind of way so that we could run the same compute job, but in a scaled down platform that doesn't require all the kind of heavy lifting that you get with Kubernetes of having to manage all the manifests and having to manage the cluster itself. So just by carefully designing the approach to migrate that existing application into containers and designing the flexibility around it, we had all these options for when we went live to host the application in different ways. And that stage of the project was pretty quick too. It took about 10 days to get to this point of having the Kubernetes option and the local Docker desktop option and the Azure Functions option, all using the same kind of core components. The API is the same everywhere and the compute module behaves the same everywhere, even though I might be using a stub when I'm running locally. Okay, so just to go back to the themes that I pointed out originally. So flexibility was really the core for this project and it should be the core for any migration project. You've got something that already works and you want to move it to a different runtime platform. Well, moving it to containers should be the last big move that you make because from then on you can run it in all sorts of different platforms using the same container logic that you've already invested in. And the speed part of this was really important. Simple things like focusing on how long it takes your Docker images to build and optimizing that, focusing on your dev workflow and optimizing around the fact that the containers look and feel the same, even though they're doing something different internally, can really shrink down your development cycles and help you be a lot more productive really quickly. And that last thing about standardization. So if you go and look at the GitHub repo and you look at all the Kubernetes manifests, and if you're not familiar with Kubernetes, it's not entirely clear what all those things are doing. But if you are familiar with Kubernetes, you don't have to have any understanding of what the API does or what the compute module itself does because you're familiar with how the application has been modeled just by looking at the YAML files. So the benefit of going through the learning curve and really learning deeply about Docker and Kubernetes is that those skills are transferable to other projects and other organizations. And when other people come into your team, if they've already got that knowledge, then they'll be up and running pretty much straight away. Okay, we're just about done. So I said there'd be a bunch of links at the end and here they are. So first of all, this is where you'll find all the demo code that I went through today. So you can try running this stuff yourself. You only need Docker desktop installed to run the kind of stub versions. If you want to try out the hybrid versions, then you need to spin up a hybrid Kubernetes cluster, which you can do in AKS or AWS or GKE. If you're interested in going through the learning curve, then I've written a book called Learn Docker in a Month of Lunches. And I'm currently writing the sequel to that, which is Learn Kubernetes in a Month of Lunches. They're both published by Manning and they're both very task focused. So there's 20 odd chapters. The idea is that each chapter has got a whole lot of exercises that you follow through. There's a lab at the end to help you cement what you've learned. And each chapter should take you about an hour. And both those books have a really clear learning journey that kind of starts from the beginning, layers on more and more understanding until you're kind of happy to run your own apps in Docker and Kubernetes. And if you're interested in those books, there's a discount here that you can use on the Manning website. And if you're not a book reader and you're more into videos, then most of my content is on Pluralsight, which is an online training platform. It's kind of like Netflix for geeks. You pay your monthly subscription and there's something like 7,000 courses on there now. I've done 20 odd courses that cover all sorts of stuff like monitoring containers with Prometheus, using Istio with Kubernetes, doing containerized builds with Jenkins, a whole lot of stuff. I'm sure you'll find something interesting there. So thank you again for watching. My name's Elton. I hope you found the session useful. I hope you enjoy the rest of DockerCon and maybe next year we can meet at DockerCon in person.